there's a lot of very good, pure and clean players here. Uh, but I do have to say that you have to go back to the design of the program itself. And to use Shake Shack as an example, I mean, everything about this bill when it was, was passed through Congress and the rules that set Treasury up, the Treasury and SBA set up, you know, would, if I was at Shake Shack, I would think I'm the intended recipient of this, right? I mean, Congress went out of its way to carve out businesses that have more than 500 employees but are, but are restaurants with chain restaurants. They wanted the money to go to chain restaurants. There's nothing in Treasury's rules that would have prevented it. And so, you know, they participated because they qualified. And then there's this tremendous political backlash. And, and so the blame really goes in the design of the program itself more than any individual business, um, you know, notwithstanding the Treasury Secretary's statement earlier. Uh, with that in mind, Neil, should those types of companies uh, even feel the pressure to give the money back? I, I get that Shake Shack is a consumer-facing uh, business and it, and it has the extra added uh, factor to, to weigh up as to whether it damages their brand long term. But what if you were a, a company that met their sort of size metrics uh, that people are so upset about, but you weren't consumer facing? Should you feel guilt tripped into returning the money or you met the, you met the terms? You don't know how difficult this uh, economic environment is going to be and, and how long it will last. Should you, should you feel guilt tripped into returning the money? I think there's two factors here. One is the obvious public relations factor, right? If it gets out into the public, like it did with the Los Angeles Lakers, um, you know, there is, there, there's real harm that could happen to your business by appearing piggish, given the fact that there isn't enough money go, to go around. And so that means that a company that, quote unquote, doesn't need the money is literally taking it out of the pocket of a smaller business that, that does. And so there's also that sort of ethical component. If you're a company that really doesn't need the money in order to maintain your payroll, um, given the current political environment and given the fact that there just wasn't enough money to go around. And I think we are headed towards around three. Uh, that's a lot of pressure that could impact the brand. But for a company that is otherwise going to be firing all these people uh, and can't survive, it's going to have to make that tough decision of whether the public relation hit uh, is worth the survival of its business. So TARP, which you all oversaw, was, was pretty controversial, Neil, and still actually remains so about whether it was fair, who, who got bailed out, whether the taxpayer got a bad or good deal. Do you think any of those kind of lessons were heated this time around from the administration, the Treasury and the lawmakers in drafting this? You know, this is an exact repeat of some of the mistakes that were made at TARP. Back then, you know, all this money was given to the banks with the hope uh, and trust that they were going to use it to restore lending to, to businesses, to help struggling homeowners. But when the money went out, there were no conditions and no incentives that the bank used the money for those purposes. And surprise, surprise, they didn't, right? They used it as any company would in a capitalist society. They used it to, to maximize profits and what they thought was best for their business. And that's just what's happening with this program. The money was given to the banks, provided to the banks to do the lending but not with any requirements or incentives that it favor smaller businesses or of, of the businesses or that it apply a level playing field. In fact, the incentives were for it to do the opposite, to service its biggest and most profitable customers. And so you're seeing the exact same thing happening again. And it was pretty obvious when the original program rules came out, that this was what's going to happen. And, you know, with more hundreds of hundreds of billions of dollars more to come in other programs, you just hope that uh, Treasury and the Federal Reserve stop repeating this mistake. If you're going to rely on banks, you have to give them clear instruct instructions, requirements, or incentives if you want them to carry out your policy goals. But, but Neil, qu qualify that for me. I mean, uh, how, how can you be sure that they've purposefully allocated these funds in order to maximize profits? I mean, all of the statistics that the big banks have released uh, to us in the last couple of days shows that the vast majority has gone to smaller customers. And, uh, you know, I'd add to that that, that clearly uh, there's some headline grabbing bigger customers. But, but could you have expected the bank to turn away Shake Shack and say, sorry, Shake Shack, yes, you qualify for, for all of the terms of this, but we've decided to say no to you? I mean, the bank doesn't really have that, that position, that authority to do that. Oh, and I'm not criticizing the banks. I, well, two things. First of all, I think some 45% of the program funds went to the top 4% of applicants. So I think there is some data to back up these criticisms. But, but, but secondly, you're entirely right. From the bank's perspective, it is following the incentives that were provided to it by Treasury and SBA in this program. And those incentives were also consistent with the general business sense where you take care of your bigger and best customers first. They also made more money per loan with the big big clients and the big loans rather than the smaller ones. 
And there was just no other incentives to counter those natural things. So I don't blame the bank for giving the loan to, to, to Shake Shack uh, that otherwise, and, and I think still qualified for the program. The problem is that if, if, you, if the government wants banks to carry out its policy, it has to counter those incentives or provide its own incentives if it wants a truly level playing field. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. The and that's not the bank's fault, and ultimately, that's that's the government's fault. The fee, sorry, so just quickly, the, the fee though, in percentage terms, is higher for a smaller loan, though. Uh, but but in dollar terms, clearly, that depends on on how many you make. But the the percentage terms, it's higher for a, a smaller loan. Sorry, Sarah. Right, but I'm sorry. No. I, mean, uh, I would just uh, no, say that. No, Neil, I was just going to ask. Go ahead. I was just going to say, well, that's true. But again, when you when you talk about the cost per, per per loan, it costs kind of the same to make all of these loans because of the underwriting standards. And so, if you can make two hundred thousand dollars doing a, a a ten million dollar loan or five thousand dollars on a hundred thousand dollar loan, you know which one are you going to do if it's generally the same amount of work? So that, that's what I was meant by the fee structure. <laughs> I was just going to say that the Treasury might respond, Neil, to you by saying that, that they actually did impose strings attached this time, but on the recipients of the loans. For instance, that you can't you know, lay off your workers and you have to keep them on payroll if you want those loans to be forgiven. And that ultimately that will be how this program is judged by how many people and how many small businesses can remain working, employed when, they, when these economies reopen. On that front, it, it feels like the jury's still out. No, no, I think that's true. And I think, you know, one of the interesting things is that a Shake Shack is, is kind of a very efficient way of, of achieving that goal. Because if you get 5,000 employees and they use that money to keep them on the, on the payroll, um, that's going to help accomplish that goal. And so, yeah, I totally agree. At the end of the day, this, this program will be judged on how many people are, are kept at work. But whenever it comes to government programs, bailout and stimulus, if over and over again, it, it be, it's the big companies and the most well-connected that benefit and the smaller guys that suffer. There's larger consequences. There's anger that generated the Tea Party and Occupy. And we've got another presidential election coming up. And this sort of repeated inequity in these systems, they, ha they carry a toll that goes beyond just jobs or dollars and cents, but really impact where we are as a country. Do you see the Federal Reserve's Main Street Lending Program going that route, too? You know, there was a lot of guidance that came out today, um, and I think that program may have been misnamed. Um, I just, uh, it, at the first look at it, some of these terms, uh, it does not seem that your typical Main Street businesses, as we think of that term, uh, are going to qualify. And if they do qualify, whether the banks, who once again were relying on the banks to administer the program, uh, are going to put, put those companies at the top of the line, uh, mm. it looks like a good program for the larger, more established businesses. Um, than it does for this sort of small mom and pop that we think about. Well, stay close. Neil Borofsky, we're going to talk about this a lot more uh, in the coming weeks. Thank you for joining us.